I read my first Puritan book when I was nine years old. I uh, was feeling very ill one day, and I prayed very hard to God that if he was really the living God, would he just show me a token of it by healing me? And just like that, I felt completely better after I prayed. It is so overwhelmed me as a nine-year-old boy that it actually brought me under conviction of sin. And uh, I thought, wow, God is amazing. God is real. But I've been a bad boy. So I went to my dad's bookcase, which was full of Puritan writings. And I combed through the bookcase, looked at different titles, and all of a sudden I caught a title, The Life and Death of Mr. Badman by John Bunyan. <laughs> and I thought, well, I've been a bad boy, and that's similar to being a bad man, so I better read this book. So I read that book and um, as a nine-year-old, and it was okay, but it didn't lead me to deliverance, and after about six months, my conviction of sin just kind of wore away. It really was only common impressions. When I was 14, I came under severe, genuine conviction and wrestled for about 18 months before I finally found deliverance. But I read in those 18 months, I read my dad's entire bookcase of Puritan paperbacks of Banner True Trust. And I would read every night. I told all my friends, I can't be your friend anymore. I need to have God. I can't be your friend till I find God. And so every night I hold myself up in the bedroom and I read the Bible from front to cover a few times in those 18 months, but I also just read the Puritans because that's about all my dad had. So I just read Puritan after Puritan after Puritan. I asked my dad, could I take ownership? Could I take ownership of the books by writing in them, putting question marks in the margin where I didn't understand them? My dad said, absolutely. He was just so happy I wanted to read them. And so I read all these books. I took ownership of them. When my dad died, I inherited them. I still come across books in our library now, and I say, oh, that's one of the books I read when I was 14 years old. Oh, well, why did I put a question mark there? It seems rather obvious. But, <laughs> but when I was 15, 16, those books were a very instrumental part in bringing me, a few other things as well, but in bringing me to liberty in Christ. And so immediately what happened was I, I said, well, if I found Christ through reading these books, and they're so rich to me, everyone, everyone needs to read these books. So I went to my local consistory of my church, and I told them, I need to start a, a Puritan library. And they looked at me, and they said, well, no, nobody's reading books around here. I said, never mind, never mind. I'll talk to them all, and I'll get them. And I was quite shy at the time, but the Lord unloosened my tongue with the gospel. And so they said, okay, we'll have a committee of three men, three elders, and um, you submit the books you want. I submitted 100 books I wanted in the library. And I said to them, I've got $550 in the bank, and I can buy all 100 of them. It won't cost you a penny. I'll just spend all my life savings and just get these books. And... They said, okay, we'll appoint three elders. They have to prove them all. One was my dad, and one was my uncle, and, <laughs> and one was another elder. My uncle approved all 100 instantly, just took a look at them and said, they're all fine. The other elder approved 92 of them. My dad approved eight of them. My dad was pretty strict at the time. So I started the library with eight books. And within six months, my dad approved all 100 and, and so did the other elder. So I got all 100 books, put them in the library, did a subject catalog, a, you know, like the old-fashioned card catalogs, did all that. And people started reading them. And I was talking to people, and a few people got converted. And so one night I had a dream. I was so excited about these books. I, had a, I dreamt about selling books. And um, in my dream, this is, I mean, this is really crazy. In my dream, I saw... Alexander, Archibald, period. Thoughts on religious experience in italic print. Retail price, $10. Our price, $8. 
And on the, on the page in the bottom, there was like a return address. And the re- return address said, Bible Truth Books. And I woke up. And I don't believe in, you know, God giving revelations and dreams. But I, on rare occasions, I do think that you can wake up and then have a good thought that comes out of a dream. <laughs> so I woke up and I thought, wow, the whole world needs these books. So I'm going to start a business called Bible Truth Books. And I, um, I went back to the, my church. I thought I needed permission from my church. And they were discouraging again. They said, well... You, you can't start a business because there's a man in Grand Rapids. I was in Kalamazoo, 50 miles away, who was selling some books. But, I mean, this man had just like a very unattractive page that he would send out to about 50 people. But anyway, I, I obeyed them. So they said, if he gives you permission, you can do it. So I drove up with my brother from Kalamazoo to Grand Rapids one day. We were weeping on the way up, beseeching God that this man would, this man would have mercy on us and allow us to sell books. We walked into his house. He had long, white, flowing hair. He looked like he was 95 years old to me. He was probably about 80. And uh, we told him what we wanted. We wanted to sell books all around the world, Puritan books. And he looked at us, and he goes, you boys, you teenagers, you want to sell books? My brother was 19. I was 16. He said, yes, sir. Go, may the whole world be your parish. He said. <laughs> we looked at it. We were so astonished. We went back into the car, and we just wept and wept and thanked God. And we started Bible Truth Books, a nonprofit organization, which, so I started selling Puritan books when I was 16. And then uh, when I was 21, I was accepted for the ministry, and I I had to to give it up, study for four years. Bible Truth Books, by the way, is still going today. But then when I was 25, I was ordained in, in Sioux Center, Iowa, and I was immediately made the president of the denomination's book ministry. So I, I kept selling Puritan books and printing them, and it was, I, I put my whole heart into it. I mean, I just put my own money into it, too. And, but then we had a tragic split in 1993, and all the books were taken away from me, even my own titles. And... Um, so I said to myself, never again am I going to put all my energy into a denominational book ministry because there's no security that you can, you can keep it. And so immediately I started Reformation Heritage Books in, in 93 and, uh, as a little hobby and uh, never dreaming that God would bring it to what it is today is, is the leading Puritan book printer uh, in the world by far. No one even comes close to how many books of the Puritans have been printed than, than Reformation Heritage books. Also, the Dutch Puritans. Um, you know, the, the people in the Netherlands, they have translated um, about 700 titles of the English Puritans into Dutch. And the English have only translated three, maybe? up until the 1990s, until I got started in it. I've done maybe 25 or 20. So we're bringing the Dutch, like Brockle, and I'm going to give another talk on the Dutch writings um, tomorrow. Uh, We're bringing them into English. And there's an advantage of doing that because the Dutch writers are just as good as the English Puritans. But when you translate them, of course, you can translate them into contemporary language. So they're very, very easy to read for people. All right. So what persuaded me, and I've been selling them ever since, so I've, I've sold million, tens of millions of dollars worth of Puritan books in my life. And I just want to tell you this. Over and over and over again, thousands upon thousands of times, people have come to me and said how blessed they are by the Puritan writers. And one of the, one of the beautiful things that um, we, we, we started doing about five, ten years ago, we're going to do a lot more of in the future by the way, is we started a series called Puritan Treasures for Today. You'll see some on the book table. Um, And Puritan Treasures for Today takes small Puritan titles of 100 to 200 pages and edits every single sentence so it reads like it was written yesterday without sacrificing any content. We have a few guys that are very gifted at doing that, 
it's a certain gift you got to have. But when people start reading the Puritans with these books, they don't get past page 10 and they say, there's something unusual about this book. It's so rich. It's so fulsome. It's so, so godly. And it's so readable. And so we're going to be bringing out a lot more in the future, Puritan treasures for Dave. We're going to ramp up the whole series. In fact, we might put new covers on them all, make them more attractive, put some in a box, and so on. So there's big plans for that. We're also continuing the Soli Deo Gloria imprint as, a, as a Puritan imprint of RHB. And um, we've got a commitment to do 84 titles in the next seven years, one per month, one Puritan title per month, plus one major set per year. So this past year, we did Thomas Goodwin. Uh, next year, we're doing Thomas Boston's 12 volumes. We're doing uh, Richard Baxter's four big volumes of, uh, of practical theology, and, and so on. Uh, so one big set every year and 12 Puritan titles every year. And uh, just pray that God will really bless these efforts and continue to promote godliness. Because when a pastor gets excited about the Puritan books and pushes them in his own congregation and people begin to read them, I've seen this over and over again in the decades of my ministry, the whole level of holiness in his congregation actually rises almost tangibly. Uh, reading the Puritan writers, if they do anything for us, they make us more conscientious, more godly, and they, they, they convict us, <laughs> but they also encourage us, and we learn to love Christ more. We learn to hate sin more, and so on. So the greatest legacy of the Puritans to us actually comes from their writings. And what most people don't realize is that one of the reasons why the Puritans were so fruitful in their writings is because you heard the history this morning. They were set out of their churches, 2,000 of them in 1662. And what happened was, and it's, it's, you know, in some ways, God can have a sense of humor at times, and this is, this is almost humorous. But what happened was the Anglican ministers knew that their churches would not grow but would only diminish if they didn't have a Puritan preacher because the Anglicans preaching was not attractive to the people, but the common people heard the Puritan preaching gladly. So what they did is they'd find a rich nobleman in their congregation, or they'd go directly to the whole congregation, and they would vote, and they would call a Puritan preacher to their church, but the Puritan preacher would be called a lecturer. So the Anglican preacher would preach on Sunday morning, the man he hired, which would be a Puritan for, to make sure his church grows, would, would preach on Sunday evening and preach on Wednesday evening. So he'd do two-thirds of the preaching, but they would call it lectures. And because they were lectures, they usually followed an order, like an expositional series of some kind. Now, the Puritan lecturers, and William Perkins was a Puritan lecturer for a while, so was Richard Sibbs, a whole bunch of the famous ones you've heard of, they didn't do much of the pastoring because the Anglican preacher was considered to be the pastor. And so they had just basically two sermons to preach per week. And they could then afford the time to write out those sermons in full and package them in books form and send them out to the printer. And therefore, you and I are the recipients today of about a thousand Puritan books and, and hundreds more to come of these Puritan lecturers who, in God's mysterious providence, were given time to write out their books so that centuries later, people could have the benefit of them. So Puritan sermons became so popular, so popular uh, in written form that publishers couldn't, couldn't publish them enough. There's a man named A.F. Herr who did his doctoral Ph.D. dissertation on the writings of the Puritan sermons. And uh, he concluded that in the 1620s, that was a high point, 24% of all printed material, religious, Christian, secular, that came off printing presses were Puritan sermons. Today, sermon books are hard to sell. 
I know that as a publisher. Less than 0.01% of Christian books are sermons. And only 2% of all literature that comes off the press at max is Christian in nature. Probably only 1%. 24% Puritan sermons? So I've also done just a, a ton of religious or, or Christian book shopping in my life to build up our seminary library and my own library. And I would, whenever I would go over and do conferences in the UK, that's where most of them are, the old antiquarian ones, I would, I would, I would devour every single bookstore in the UK. They all know me. And uh, I would go to one bookstore after another. And whenever I would see an old book in vellum cover, the old original cover, the first year or two, I would get excited. My heart would skip a beat. There's an old Puritan. I'd open it up. Oh, it was an Anglican book. Still in the original cover. I'd find a book that was rebound or a book that's fallen apart. Now that's when I get excited because they were read by so many people. There's no Puritan book in the UK that you'll ever find in the original cover because everybody read them, and they fell apart, and they rebound them, and they re-rebound them, and they re-re-rebound them. They were popular because they spoke to the language and to the hearts of the people. So in the last 70 years, there has been between 900 and 1,000 Puritan books reprinted. And the book that I wrote with Randall Peterson called Meet the Puritans, which has reviews of 700 of those in it, all the books published up until 2006, as well as many biographies of all the 150 Puritans that have been reprinted. Right now, as we speak, uh, that's my writing project. We're, I'm working with uh, two other guys, including Randall and one other guy, and we're working on doing an upgrade of that book. It probably will take us three years or so. There's been about 300 more titles. So that's going to expand we're going to expand the biographies, we're going to expand the reviews, and it's going to become a book about twice the size um, because there's just so much been done with the Puritans in the last uh, uh, 16, 16 years since we, since we printed that. So in this talk, what I want to do is I want to look at why is there so much enthusiasm? Why do God's people resonate so well with the Puritan literature? And, and to answer that question, I want to just look at three simple thoughts with you. First, the characteristics of Puritan writing. Second, the major themes that really help us in Puritan writing. And then third, I want to look with you at some of the classics of, of Puritan writing. So characteristics, themes, and classics. Let's pray. Lord God, we... Lift up this address to thee. We pray it may do a world of good to those who are present and also those who are listening or will listen. And we ask that thy benediction would rest upon our time together and that thou wouldst move many, many tens of thousands of more Christians into reading the Puritans in, in all the major languages around the world and that their, their lives would grow by it and through it and in it, and that thy kingdom would come through the resurrection of this uh, valuable, spiritually rich literature. We pray that our own hearts would be aroused and spiritual growth would ensue by reading their writings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, characteristics. Number one, of course, the obvious one you expect, Puritan writing is incredibly biblical. It's Bible, 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 Bible. Uh, they feed upon the Word. Their sermons were expositions of the Word. They memorized hundreds and thousands of texts as Puritan preachers. They were as familiar with Habakkuk and Micah as they were with Romans and John. I always say to my students, if you want to be humbled, if you're, or if you're getting too proud in the ministry, what you do is you go over to your bookshelf, you take off a you take out a volume of, of one of John Owen's complete works and you just spread it open in front of you and look at all the scriptural citations across one page. You'll be humbled. At the command to have of scripture. 
These are men who knew their Bibles. They sang the Bible. They, they preached the Bible. They prayed the Bible. When they prayed, they usually used texts from the Word of God. They fed upon the Bible. They, they talked about the Bible. They lived the Bible. Their lives were shaped by the Bible. Number two, Puritans were doctrinal, doctrinal. When they preached, they often would have a few pages of exposition of the text, and then they would say something like this, and I'm not saying this is the best way to preach. I'm just saying this is how they would do it. The doctrine we learn from this text is, and they put it in the center of the page, and then the rest of the sermon would be an exposition of that doctrine. So they did do a lot of topical preaching of various doctrines. But to them, doctrinal preaching was biblical preaching because they said all the Bible is doctrinal. Now, that means that they were keen on informing the mind of true doctrine and then applying it to the heart. They understood that a mindless Christianity would soon promote a spineless Christianity. So they didn't try to dazzle their readers or their hearers with scholarship. Rather, they favored the plain and clear statement of God's truth. But it was doctrinal. Thomas Brooks said, starched oratory may tickle the brain, but it's plain doctrine that informs the judgment, that convinces the conscience, that bows the will, and that wins the heart. Don't you just love those Puritan quotes? <laughs> they could say a, a whole page in one sentence. It's amazing. Third, Puritan writing is not only biblical and doctrinal, but also experiential. And by experiential, I mean they stressed, they stressed how a Christian's life ought to go in his own experience by the work of the Holy Spirit in his soul, how it really does go, which is something short of how it ought to go, and what is the end goal? We're on our way to everlasting glory with Christ. I often use this example to explain what experiential preaching is. When I, when I left the army, I got another army story. Somehow I, I never have two army stories in one day, but here it is. Uh, when I left the army, the, my, my boss said to me, you've got to remember if you're called back up to fight, you've got to remember three things. You've been taught to fight. You've got to remember how a war should go. Number two, you've got to remember that wars never go the way they should go. They're always bloody and messy and take surprising twists and turns. And number three, you've got to remember the end goal. You're fighting for Uncle Sam. You're fighting for the United States of America. Well, the Puritans would say, that's a pretty good paradigm for experiential preaching from a spiritual perspective. We as ministers, we have to preach how the Holy Spirit works in the way that the Christian life should go. Romans 8, no condemnation, no separation, and you're filled with the Spirit. And we're more than conquerors through Christ who love us. That's the way we should live. Second, you also got to preach Romans 7, the struggle with indwelling sin. You see, oh, wretched man that I am, the good that I would, I do not, the evil that I would not, I find myself doing. You got to preach that as well, what goes on inside a believer, which is short of the ideal. And then you've got to preach the end goal, Revelation 21, 22, to, to be with Christ forever in glory. We're on our way to the celestial city to, sin, to be sin-free in Emmanuel's land. And so you find it over and over and over again in the Puritan writings. They preach the work of the Holy Spirit in the soul, how it ought to go, how it does go, and what is the end goal. And so fourth, their Puritan writing is always practical, practical. They focus on personal, comprehensive conversion. They don't only say, except a man be born again, he shall not see the kingdom of God. But they developed from Scripture a careful description of all the marks of grace, all the fruits of grace. They know how to describe a true Christian's proper actions at home, in the church, at work, in society. They wanted to take everything the Reformers said. By the way, they were thoroughly Reformed. But they wanted to sit on the Reformers' shoulders and say, 
we don't have to spend quite as much time as the Reformers did explaining justification by faith alone and how to worship. The Reformers have done all that work for us. We can now take all these doctrines and we can apply them to daily life. How, how can you be the best possible Christian husband or wife or child or employee or employer? So they wrote 29 books, 29 books on marriage, for example. Actually, Living in a Godly Marriage, this is a book I did with James LaBelle. It takes all 29 of these books, The Wisdom of the Puritans, and puts it into one contemporary book for you, basically what the Puritans said about marriage. And they were light years ahead of us uh, on marriage. Uh, It's amazing when you read their books. So what you want to understand is that the Puritans are, are just like the Reformers in terms of all the Reformation doctrines but they had the time and the energy and the wherewithal and the passion to take all those Reformation doctrines and apply them to every area of life and say, how do you use that now as a husband? How do you use that as a believer? So in their sermons, you always find near the end uses. Use number one, use number two, objection to use number two, answer to objection to use number two, use number three, use number four, right? Right? They're applying. They are the par excellence appliers of the Bible, of all the writers in human history. And then fifth, Puritan writing is ecclesiastical. They believed in the centrality of the church in the purposes of Christ. Some people think they didn't care about the church because so many of them left. Well, they left with tears running down their eyes because they grieved over the church's departure from solid biblical truth. They still cared about the church. The more radical Puritans, which we call pilgrims, they said, okay, the church is hopeless. We just, we just got to start our own churches. But the mainstream Puritans either stayed in the Church of England, if they possibly could without being kicked out. Some of them had archbishops over them that disobeyed Elizabeth's rules or King James' rules, as you heard about this morning and just let them go on their way. It didn't do anything. And others said, you know, like the 2,000 kicked out, we cannot agree with these half-Romish principles. And so we will go out and start churches on our own somewhere or, or, or emigrate to America or to the Netherlands. But our heart still beats for the church. And so they wrote about the church they, they preach for the church. They, uh, they, they wrote about liturgical reform for the church. They, they, they exercised spiritual brotherhood in the church. They uh, quoted theologians from the past in their sermons, in their writings. Uh, they, were, they were churchmen. They were churchmen. Uh, sixth, Puritan writing is national and international. In the great questions of national life, presented by the crises of their own day. They looked to Scripture for light, for light on the duties, the power, and the rights of king and and of parliament and of citizen subjects. Uh, And yet, they went beyond their own nation. There was an international spiritual brotherhood among the Puritans of uh, Reformed Christianity. That's why their books were printed in so many languages, especially Dutch in, in German. And seventh, Puritan writing is eschatological and doxological. They always lived with one eye on eternity. And the one eye that they had on time, even that was subject to eternity. So they, they lived in two worlds, and they teach us how to live in two worlds. They really were pilgrims making progress, going through the Vanity Fair of this life on the way to the celestial city. Pilgrim's Progress is an incredible illustration of the Puritan spiritual life. And so they, as Richard Baxter called his his 800-page tome, The Saints' Everlasting Rest, they were longing for that rest and glory. They were longing for the return of Christ even as they were longing to walk godly through Vanity Fair of this world 
on their way to the celestial city. So in summary, doctrinally, Puritanism was a kind of vigorous Calvinism. Experientially, it was warm and contagious. Evangelistically, it was aggressive and tender. Think of Baxter's, a call to the unconverted, or Joseph Align, alarm to the unconverted. Those books were used for the conversion of tens and thousands of people, both of them. They were earnest. They were hard-hitting, and they were inviting. Ecclesiastically, Puritans were God-centered and worshipful. Politically, they aimed to be scriptural and balanced and bound by conscience before God and in their relationships with the king, the parliament, and subjects. Perhaps G.I. Packer said it best. Puritanism, he says, was an evangelical holiness movement seeking to implement its vision of spiritual renewal, both national and personal, in the church, the state, and the home, in education, evangelism, and economics, in individual discipleship and devotion, and in pastoral care and competence. Calvinism applied to every area of life. That's Puritanism. Okay, that's point one. Point two, the themes, the themes of Puritan writing. The Puritans had several important themes. I'm just going to run them by you very quickly. Number one, be humbled by the sinfulness of your sin. Be humbled by the sinfulness of your sin. We are guilty both in Adam and we are guilty in our own corrupt nature and deeds. They called sin, sin. They taught commonly that the smallest sin is a greater evil than the greatest affliction. You would never hear a Puritan say, I know this isn't right to do, but never. Sin was abominable. Sin, the smallest sin, if unwashed by the blood of Christ, is enough to throw you into hell because God will allow nothing that is less than perfect into the glories of heaven. So the sinfulness of sin should humble us to the dust. If you ever have a low view of sin, you read Thomas Watson's The Mischief of Sin, or Jeremiah Burroughs' The Evil of Evils, or Ralph Venning, The Sinfulness of Sin. Those books will lay you in the dust before God, I promise you. And the Puritan idea was that he who has slight views of sin, as one Puritan puts it, will have slight views of Christ. But he who has serious views of sin will have serious views of Christ. So they knew how to convict consciences. Puritans wouldn't stand on the pulpit and say something that would make you feel guilty and then say, like so many modern preachers, right after they say it, but I don't want to make you feel guilty or anything. No, they wanted to make you feel guilty. One Puritan said, I want, to go be, I want to go and beat down every bush behind which the old Adam hides and drag that old Adam out naked and stand him before God. <laughs> Hebrews 4.12. God brings us out naked before him. Why? So that we need his son. That's the point. That's the point. So I'm just going to read you one sentence here to make you feel guilty. <laughs> Richard Mayo, not a very well-known Puritan, but he's preaching to his congregation about how sinful they are before he opens up the balm of Gilead in the blood of Christ. But he concludes his section with just this one sentence. Just listen to this one sentence. Who preaches like this today? Very few. Should that man be proud that has sinned as much as you have sinned? and live as you have lived, and wasted so much time, and abused so much mercy, and omitted so many duties, and neglected such great means of grace as you have done? Should that man be proud, who has so grieved the Spirit of God, so violated the law of God, so dishonored the name of God? Should that man be proud, who has a heart, the kind of heart that you have? Do you understand what the Holy Spirit did with that kind of preaching? It convicts people. I need a savior. I can't reform myself. It's exactly the goal of the Puritans. 
you wound the conscience. You prick the conscience with the needle of the law, but you tie to the needle the scarlet thread of the gospel symbolizing the blood of Christ. And you wove, you weave the soul, you sew the soul back together, the soul you've wounded with that scarlet thread. Second, focus on Christ, therefore. The Puritans were more about Christ than they were against sin. As much as they preached against sin, they preached more about Jesus. Thomas Adams, listen to him. Christ is the sum of the whole Bible prophesied, typified, prefigured, exhibited, demonstrated, to be found in every leaf, every page, almost every line, the Scriptures being but, as it were, the swaddling bands of the child Jesus. The Puritans understood that Christ's incarnation, obedience to God's law, sufferings and death for our sin, resurrection from the dead, ascension into heaven, session at God's right hand, second coming in glory, are the heart and soul of Christianity as grounded in Jesus Christ. Samuel Rutherford said, put the beauty of 10,000, thousand worlds of paradises like the Garden of Eden all into one. Put all trees and all flowers and all smells and all colors and all tastes and all joys and all loveliness and all sweetness into one. Oh, what a fair and excellent thing would that be. And yet it would be less to that fair and dearest, well-beloved Jesus Christ than one drop of rain is to all the seas and rivers and lakes and foundations and oceans of 10,000 earths. Wow. Wow. Jesus, you see, is everything. Three, maintain biblical balance. I could say a lot here, but let me just briefly say, the Puritans were keen not just to balance sinfulness of sin with the glories of Christ, but they were keen to balance God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. They were keen to balance the objective gospel in Christ and the subjective application of the gospel. They wanted to bring the whole counsel of God to their people. So in individual sermons, they might just have one string on their guitar, the string of their text. But over a period of time, they would be bringing their people, the whole counsel of God. Number four, persevere in catechizing. They really believed in catechizing. Uh, Let me just illustrate this very quickly with this example. Errol Hulse, I quoted him this morning. He's a dear friend of mine. Errol Hulse once worked for Billy Graham. He was an associate of Billy Graham. And they had these mass evangelism campaigns, as you know. But Errol Hulse actually had to leave those campaigns because he determined, he wrote a book called The Pastor's Dilemma. He determined at the end of the day that there were no fruits from all those people that came forward beyond maybe 2 to 5% maximum. And yet the counselors were telling them, well, now you're saved, now you don't, you don't feel anything yet, but that's okay. You're saved, and you have the full assurance of faith. And these people would leave thinking they're Christians. Many of them wouldn't even go to church. Many of them wouldn't leave apostate churches. So Billy Graham had to leave. I mean, Errol Hulse, sorry. Errol Hulse had to leave Billy Graham. And the reason why, he said, was not that none of these people were genuinely saved, But the problem was there was no follow-up discipleship. See, in the Puritan system, in the Puritan system, catechizing was a follow-up discipleship. Now, you contrast that 2 to 5% with Richard Baxter in Kidderminster, who would spend three days a week from morning to evening going from home to home, catechizing each family, talking to the children, And Richard Baxter could write this without any boasting that there were 700 people that he knew of who were genuinely converted in his years in Kidderminster. He said when he came to Kidderminster, most families, there wasn't one family on a block where someone was saved. And by the time he was done, there were a few houses on the block where there wasn't at least one person saved. Just reversed. And then he makes this amazing statement. He said, by this close discipleship, he experienced that there wasn't a single one of all his converts that he knew turned back to the world. Not a single one out of all 700. And he would catechize them, you see. 
He would watch over their souls. And that's what the Puritans were big at. Most ministers, most Puritan ministers, did you know that? They wrote their own catechism book, if they were, if they were worth their salt. And they'd give it to their people. Then they would come to their houses and say, let me do catechism in front of you, Father. And then you model it after I leave. And they would catechize the kids in front of the dad and mom, and the dad would, would model it. And so the parents would catechize their children as well. Fifth, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Well, the Puritans were great advocates of preaching. They knew that a prayerless preacher is a powerless preacher. And so they were big on prayer as well. And they prayed constantly, constantly for their people. And uh, Robert Trail wrote, too many good sermons are lost for lack of much prayer ahead of time in the study. Sixth, they knew how to handle trials Christianly. They suffered a great deal. The average Puritan family had nine children, and they lost half of them by the time they reached adulthood. They knew what it was to face persecution, imprisonment, exile, depression. They called it melancholy. Crushing conviction of sin and fear of damnation. Bloody civil wars, the Black Plague, the Great Fire of London, to name only a few. And so they wrote books about how to handle affliction, lots of them. Uh, they wrote uh, Lifting Up for the Downcast uh, by William Bridge. The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment by Jeremiah Burroughs. Mute Christian Under the Rod uh, by Thomas Brooks. The Crook in the Lot by the Scottish man, uh, Thomas Boston. And one of the best lessons they teach us from trials is to let go of this world and seek more to live for the glory of the world to come. I love Thomas Watson's quote. It's a famous quote. You've probably heard of it. God would have the world hang like a loose tooth in our, our mouths, which being easily twitched away does not much bother us. So you don't live for this world. You live for the world to come. John Trapp, he who rides to be crowned, need not fear a few rainy days on earth. See, you're going through Vanity Fair on your way to the celestial city. And finally, number seven, rely on the Holy Spirit. The ministers relied on the Holy Spirit twice for every sermon. Preparation and then delivery. But also they taught their people to rely on the Holy Spirit. Uh, Thomas Wilson has this, or Thomas Watson has this wonderful quote. We ministers bring the words to the ears of the people. The Holy Spirit takes those words and uses them as a key to open the heart. We can do it, but the Holy Spirit can and the Holy Spirit will. Well, that's just seven, seven lessons that their writings teach us, seven major themes of the Puritans. There, there's many more. Let me move to the third point then, the classics, the classics of, of Puritan literature. Where, would you, where should you begin? Where should you begin in reading about the Puritans, learning about them? Well, the best overall book, which is a really good book, is Leland Riken, The Worldly Saints. It's called The Puritans as They Really Were. It's about a 400-page book. Um, a shorter book is... Uh, Peter Lewis, The Genius of Puritanism, and uh, the book I held up this morning with, that I wrote with Michael Reeves, Following God Fully. That's the simplest, shortest one. Following God Fully, an introduction to the Puritans. Now, for the basic biographies of the 150 Puritans, I've already mentioned Meet the Puritans with a Guide to Modern Reprints. For the best introduction to the theology of the Puritans, that's at a reasonable <laughs> thickness, would be J.I. Packer, A Quest for Godliness, The Puritan Vision of the Christian Life. But if you really want something more thorough, then get A Puritan Theology, Doctrine for Life by Mark Jones and me. I also have a book called Puritan Reformed Spirituality, which I follow the line of holiness from Kelvin all the way through the Puritans and look at the English, the Scottish, and the Dutch. And Puritan Reform Theology, my most recent book, Historical, Experiential, and Practical Studies for the Whole of Life. This looks at more than theology in Puritan teaching. It looks at what the Puritans taught about marriage, what they taught about family life, what they taught about how to use time, for example, 
and other things, Puritan Reformed theology. Now, the Puritans can be difficult to read. And so this Puritan treasure series that I mentioned already, here's, here's an example, an honest, well-experienced heart, the piety of John Calvin. Um, this, this gives you some, some simple writings of, of John Flavel. But the triumphing over sinful fear by Flavel or uh, Stop Loving the World by William Greenhill, these are all little books where every sentence is, is edified. I recommend you start there if you if you uh, have never read the Puritans, and you'll find reading old words to be, to be difficult. Now, if you have uh, no problem reading a simple Puritan in the original that he wrote it, but you still haven't read much of the Puritans, I would begin with Thomas Watson. So what, what I'd like to do in, in the last uh, uh, 12 minutes here, I'd like to just give you uh, 12 Puritan books starting with authors, starting with the simplest and moving to the more difficult. And uh, I hope that um, you'll, you'll find this, this, this helpful. Um, I, have to, I have to pass by dozens of other Puritan writers, of course. Number one is Thomas Watson. That's a good place to begin. Heaven Taken by Storm is just a wonderful book by Watson. It talks about how to use all the means of grace, one per chapter. That's a great place to begin or to begin with his Doctrine of Repentance, or his art of divine contentment, and then work your way up in Watson's corpus to his body of divinity. Second, um, John Flavel. Flavel was uh, a pastor who pastored a seaport congregation, so he became well-known at reducing his sermons down to a simple, simple level. I know a pastor who reads out loud for his devotions one sermon every day, of John Flavel, gets to the end of the six volumes and starts over again. Because he says, Flavel just feeds my soul at such a beautiful, simple level. Now, we just took his fountain of life just a few months ago and simplified it just a little bit, edited it a little bit, and we we put it out in two volumes. And the fountain of life is about Christ, about his uh, threefold office and about his states. of humiliation and exaltation. So we just split them in two volumes, Threefold Office of Christ, um, and they're on the table here as well. Third, John Bunyan. You, you, if you've never read Pilgrim's Progress, um, I'm tempted to say shame on you, but that's not right. Uh, go do it right away. I mean, this is e- the classic of all classics in English literature. And uh, it's so full of spiritual instruction. As I said, my dad read it to us every single Sunday night for all 20 years I was home. And uh, our kid, the kids would sit around in front of him and he would, he would teach us with tears coming out of his eyes about how God works in the soul as we would pepper him with questions throughout this story. Uh, it's, it's just a wonderful, wonderful book. But, but John Bunyan wrote 60 books and uh, he wrote most of his books in prison. And, and he wrote them just with a fox's book of martyrs in a Bible. Uh, it's unbelievable. And he, wasn't, he was the only Puritan just about that wasn't educated. I mean, extraordinary gift. And uh, he can still speak to your heart today. His book on the intercession of Christ is, is amazing. Number four, George Swinock. Uh, you might want to try his Fading of the Flesh and the Flourishing of Faith, which uh, we have in the Puritan Treasures uh, simple volume. The Christian Man's Calling by, by Swinock is two full volumes. Christian Man's Calling in every area of life. Number five, Thomas Brooks. Brooks was my, when I was 15 years old, uh, Watson was my favorite Puritan. Then when I was 16, it became Brooks. And when I was 17, it became Thomas Goodwin. And it stayed Thomas Goodwin until I, about five years ago. Now I'm, I, I'm probably in, more into Anthony Burgess. But uh, Brooks is a very, very colorful writer, full of illustrations. His precious remedies against Satan's devices should be must-reading for every Christian to understand the the devices of Satan. His Heaven on Earth, which is a treatise on assurance of faith, ought to be must-reading. He's got a whole volume of 500 pages on how to grow in holiness. Just a wonderful writer. Number six, Samuel Rutherford. Samuel Rutherford, what a writer he is. 
I kept his letters. He's a Scottish Puritan with a small p. I kept his letters, the original volume of 600 pages, on my nightstand for 20-some years. And whenever I was the least bit down, um, before I'd go to bed, I'd, 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 I'd dip in there and read a couple letters of Rutherford. And he, he just lifts you up by, by, by just every letter is filled with Christ and uh, movingly filled with Christ. If you want a book to encourage you, read, uh, read Rutherford's letters. Now, the next three... Oh, by the way, I should also tell you that um, Reformation Heritage Books, and this is very exciting to me, we've got a nine-year project that we just finalized about six months ago, and it's to do the complete works of Samuel Rutherford in 13 volumes, averaging 921 pages per volume. And this includes... The translation, 25% of his corpus is still in Latin, including a systematic theology in Latin. How that's possible, I don't know. But we're translating it right now. And we want to bring, we want to bring the whole corpus of Rutherford uh, into print. Now, the next three writers are at a medium level. One is William Perkins. I talked about him this morning. His 10 volumes are now available. They're worth their weight in gold. I had the privilege of being the editor of the whole series. I said to Derek Thomas, and to one of our proofreaders who proofed them all, I said, we three are probably the only three people in the entire world that have read the complete works of, of William Perkins. But I hope there's going to be thousands more very soon, because now you can read them in plain, plain English. Um, Perkins is great. He was the father of Puritanism. He, he, he has it all. He has it all. He's a mixture of everything. He's a great expositor, a great preacher, great in the experiential end, great in the objective, subjective end. Um, his, his work called Golden Chain of How the Holy Spirit Works in the Soul is, is simply a masterpiece. His Art of Prophesying is the basic homiletics textbook that the Puritan pastors, even some other pastors, used in England uh, for generations. And it's just a 200-page book. Eight, Richard Sibbs. Richard Sibbs. What a godly preacher he is. His bruised reed has helped many wounded souls to find peace in Christ. Nine, Anthony Burgess, now my favorite Puritan. I want, to, I want to redo all of his writings. I want to bring out his entire corpus too, if the Lord spares me. Um, we just printed his 145 sermons on John 17. 145 sermons on John 17 in two volumes. And he never repeats himself. It's a wonderful, wonderful set of books. Um, his work on assurance of faith, which we have printed in one of the Puritan treasures for today, every sentence edited. I, I did that one myself. Um, he, I'm convinced he's the very best Puritan on the doctrine of assurance of faith of the 40-some Puritans that wrote books on the subject. The last three Puritans are the most difficult to read but rewarding. So if you, if, you, if you can read Perkins and Sibbs and Burgess, by that time, you're ready to read Sharnock, Goodwin, and Owen. Sharnock's classic is, of course, the existence and the attributes of God, uh, the greatest work ever written on the attributes of God. It's massive. It's a bit scholastic, but it's richly biblical and warmly applies the attributes to daily life. Mark Jones right now who co-authored a Puritan theology with me. He is editing this work for Crossway. It's supposed to come out in about a month. So that will be good. That will make it more readable. And he, he footnotes all the different people mentioned by Sharnock. So that's, that's the addition to get when it comes out. RHB will have it probably at almost 50% off because we will buy 1,000 copies or more from Crossway. Uh, 11, Thomas Goodwin. Thomas Goodwin. He's deep spiritually deep, rich, uh, Christ the mediator, Christ set forth, and the heart of Christ in heaven toward sinners on earth are three of the best books ever written about Jesus. An unregenerate man's guiltiness before God in respect of sin and punishment is the most powerful treatise I've ever read on original sin and the guilt and total depravity of fallen mankind. And 12, John Owen. Now, most Christians today who are really into the Puritans, probably 75% of them, 
would pick Owen over Goodwin. I'm one of the oddballs. I pick Goodwin over Owen, but I still love Owen. Owen is a great, deep, spiritual writer. Uh, his volume two on communion with distinct persons of the Trinity, 400 pages on how to commune with the Father and then the Son and then the Holy Spirit it is a masterpiece. His mortification of sin is a famous classic. His work on Psalm 130 is one of the most experiential books you could ever read. His spiritual mindedness and on and on it goes. Crossway is actually doing his complete works. 16 volumes of his works right now by Banner Truth Trust and seven volumes on Hebrews. That's 23 volumes and the one volume of biblical theology. 24 volumes is his present corpus. I think that Crossway is doing a set of 48 volumes. And they found other work. Crawford Gribben found other works of John Owen that had never been printed. And so all of that's coming. It's beginning next year. I did for Crossway the volume of Owen on mortification of sin. And that's going to come out in a beautiful edited series of books with lots of good footnotes to help you and 40-page introductions explaining the book and the context and so on. It's going to be amazing. So save your pennies. Um, now, in addition to these, I want to just mention that there are Dutch and Scottish and, uh, uh, and, and Puritans that are just post-Puritan that you cannot possibly not mention in a list like this. I'm just going to give them to you in three, one minute each. Wahamasa Brockel is one of the leading Dutch Further Reformation divines. His Christian's Reasonable Service, which I edited over a six-year period, Bart Elsau translated, a great Dutch translator, into English. Um, we've sold over 30,000 sets of that. That's the book I said I would take on a desert island. It is, it is an incredible systematic theology with practical applications of every doctrine at the end of every subject. So my own Reformed Systematic Theology, which the last volume, by the way, volume four, just got submitted to Crossway uh, two months ago, and it will come out this coming October, um, is patterned after that, only written in a contemporary way. So what these volumes do, and, and my own set as well, it, they look at what the Bible says about each doctrine, then what church history says about each doctrine, then how do you experience each doctrine, what are the major practical takeaways of each doctrine, and then we end in doxology with a poem or a hymn. And uh, this is the kind of thing the old systematic theologies did, and particularly Brockle. Thomas Boston, his 12 works, he's an incredible writer from the Scottish background. Uh, his human nature in his fourfold state is a classic. And then Petrus van Maastricht, which John Owen said his systematic theology of seven volumes is the best thing ever written by any man in the history of mankind other than the Bible. Jonathan Edwards said that. That is finally being translated from Latin. And I have the privilege of being the editor of that. And uh, I just completed volume four. And the translator, Michael Spangler and Todd Rister, are doing a fantastic job. Uh, you'll see volumes one, two, three on the table. I, I saw the whole pile has gone down already, two-thirds. But there still be a few there. But this is an incredible set of books. But this is a high-level systematics. It's not for uh, novices. It's a high-level systematics, packed full of substance, every single sentence but also written not just for the mind, but also for the heart. We hope to complete all seven volumes by 2026, the Lord willing. And then finally, of course, Jonathan Edwards. The big debate always, is he a Puritan? Is he not a Puritan? Well, the Puritan age ends in the early 18th century. Edwards lived to be until 1758. Some ways he is, some ways he isn't. I usually include him in, as the last Puritan. And... Um, Edwards' writings are, of course, absolutely fantastic. Yale has been reprinting them at $155 a volume. They stopped after volume 26 because they couldn't sell that many, couldn't sell enough for the price they're charging. And there's 48 more volumes that haven't been printed of Edwards' writings. And we have them all in edited form from Yale. And Yale has given us permission to reprint them. So we're going to be starting that in the next couple of years, uh, reprinting a lot of the unprinted works 
of Jonathan Edwards. All right, finally, conclusion. This literature is so rich, can do so many people so much good. So what I'm going to ask of you to think about is why do you go out and give Christmas gifts at the end of the year to anybody that's not a book? I can save you so much time and so much money. we got steep discounts. You can just come to our table. You can load yourself up with Christmas gifts, and you have so much more time for your family come December, and you'll do so much more good by giving good books to your friends. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank thee so much for Puritan writings. Please use them. Please bless them to our souls, the souls of our families, the souls of our church members, the souls of our friends. Help us to feast on these incredible riches and that our souls may make gain thereby. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.